Good evening. Great to be with you, and I'm glad that you're here, those who are here in person, and also those who are here online. We're so thankful for you and that you've tuned in and are a part of this service with us together. We are broadcasting live from the Central Church of Christ here in Martinsburg, West Virginia. We appreciate those of you who are joining in, and I would encourage you to get your Bible and open it to the book of 1 Corinthians this evening in chapter 9, and we will be beginning there in verse 19 in just a moment. In a series of sermons which we have entitled 1 Corinthians Today, a series that is designed to draw practical lessons from an ancient book uh, that we can uh, follow in our lives here in modern and current culture. I want to say to those of you who are assembled here, this is the B plus group this evening. Uh, B plus means very, very good, but not quite perfect. Uh, there's, there's nobody here, I guess, who's claiming to be perfect, but we've got a lot of very, very good folks here tonight, and we're thankful for that. Everybody is socially distanced. Everybody is wearing masks. For those of you who are yet looking forward to returning, we encourage you and invite you to continue to watch on, uh, on the live stream and return when it is appropriate uh, for you to do so. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we looked in the first part of this chapter, verses 1 through 18, about Paul's apostleship. And he begins in verse 19, a section which we are entitling, By All Means. By All Means. That's verses 19 through 27. Verse 19 says, For though I was free from all men... I brought myself under bondage to all that I might gain the more. And in just a few moments, gentlemen, I may have to step to the forward microphone because I don't have a monitor and way of seeing that that I can read. I can I could barely see that one, but it's on and off. Now it's on. So, oh, there it is. Great, great. See, these guys are good. Let me tell you, folks. Though I was free from all men, I brought myself under bondage to all that I might gain the more. I'd like you to notice here that Paul had just explained the need to sometimes give up the right to do certain things. You remember we talked about that in the prior verses, how he had a right to expect financial support from the church at Corinth as he had received from other congregations, but he did not exercise that right at Corinth, and he explained his reasons for that. Uh, just because we have a right doesn't mean we have to exercise it. That's an important principle that we've talked about. Also, though, he continues here to use himself as an example, and he's going to lay out some very timely um, procedural matters that should govern our thinking and the way that we live our lives. Now, before we go any further, I want to plant a seed in your mind for you to be thinking about, if you would. You can sort of keep this on the back burner for a little while. When was the last time you went out of your way, maybe did something uncomfortable or that you didn't really want to do, in order to reach the lost? Just think about that for a few moments as we move through these verses. The Apostle Paul was a tremendous soul winner, and he was very interested in even going out of his way and making his life a, a great blessing to others. Incidentally, for those who are watching online, you can't hear it, but we are hearing rain, and it is such a delightful sound because we need rain. We need rain badly. We've, we've been on the verge of a drought here in this area, so it's great to hear a little bit of rain tonight. We notice also that Paul deliberately denied his own desires and his preferences in order to reach others. He says, though I was free from all men, I brought myself under bondage to all. Look at the wording there. He considered himself as a slave to other people. Why? That I might gain the more. That I might somehow reach someone for Jesus Christ. Question, do you think of yourself as a slave to other people? You say that to some people nowadays, and you're going to get in trouble. But you know, the Bible says we are all to be slaves 
In fact, the word bondservant is used many, many times in the scriptures to describe the Apostle Paul himself and the relationship that we should feel toward our Lord and Master and that we should also be subservient to one another. Why? Well, because that's how we're going to reach other people. We're going to treat other people better than ourselves. Philippians chapter 2, Paul taught that we should have the mind of Christ, who, was a ser- who had a servant mentality. You see, that's a very different way of looking at ourselves than what is presented oftentimes in the culture, where people are encouraged to think of themselves as, as uh, you know, full of rights and very high and mighty. And <laughs> there's nothing wrong with having these rights, but Paul said, you know what? I got some rights I didn't even exercise. Why? I am interested in you. I want to gain people for Jesus Christ. I'm talking about souls to bring them to Jesus Christ. This is Paul's mindset. And we could learn something from that, I think, if we're very, very thoughtful about that principle. Verse 20, he says, and to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, not being myself under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. When he says there, the Jews, I think he is referring to unconverted Jews, that is, uh, of the stock of Israel who had not yet obeyed the gospel. Now, we studied in our Bible class this morning, Romans, and I hope you were able to tune into that and be a part of that study, where Paul describes there who is the real Jew in the spiritual sense, okay? Not in an earthly or uh, uh, physical sense. So it's important to recognize there that, that, that there were people, and there still are today, who are of the Jewish race or of whatever race, but Paul says, I became as that race, as a Jew in this case, unconverted. To Jesus Christ. When he mentions those under the law, then he's probably talking about those Jews who had been under the law of Moses, who were newly converted to Jesus Christ, members of the church, but they were still feeling obligated in some ways to keep that Mosaic law. Remember we talked about that and he was addressing those people Some of them were rather weak or shallow in their learning. They were weak in in their understanding. And he said, "You you have to be careful with people like that. Don't cast a stumbling block in front of them, those under the law. Not that they were literally still under the legal operation of the old law. Paul says, though I myself am not under the law. I understand that. But he was careful to relate to them. On their terms, he was careful not to be a stumbling block to them. And he became, as much as he could, consistent with Christianity, he became as one under the law. I think of the case of Timothy, whom Paul says uh, he took him and circumcised him, even though Timothy was a, a grown man by this time, he was a young man, you read about that in Acts chapter 16 and verse 31. Why, did, why was that done? Because of the Jews that were there. <clears throat> he was disarming the prejudice that might otherwise interfere with Paul's preaching and with Timothy's preaching. Now you talk about becoming all things to all men, going out of your way, talk about doing something uncomfortable. Timothy was willing to do that. And I think it probably hurt Paul more than it hurt Timothy. But he, had, he, did, he did it to reach people with the gospel. Acts chapter 16 and verse 31. Verse 21. To them that are without law as without law, not being without law to God, but under law to Christ, that I might gain, gain them that are without law. I think I've already covered that. And when he says them that are without law, I think he's talking again outside the scope of the Mosaical law. Let's go to verse 22. 
To the weak I became weak, he says, that I might gain the weak. And I am become all things to all men that I may by all means save some. Now there's the title of our lesson tonight. By all means. Obviously, by all legitimate means. When he's talking about the weak here, he's talking about those who are spiritually weak. Those who are less mature in their understanding of the gospel. You see, everyone in the church isn't at the same level of maturity, spiritually speaking. There are novices in the church, and there's nothing wrong with being a novice. You know, when I got my first amateur radio license, it was called, and I guess it, the entry level license is still called the novice class. Well, that wasn't an offensive term. That was a way of saying that you were a beginner. Every Christian is at some point a beginner. We come up out of the watery grave of baptism. We are a novice. And in that one particular, at least, we are not qualified yet to serve as a, an elder. An elder is not to be a novice, according to Paul, Paul's letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 3. But there's a period of maturing and growth that takes place before one would expect to be able to shepherd other people. How many novices are in the Lord's church? Well, it depends. There are congregations with many, many novices. Somebody said, well, I'm not a novice. I've been in the church for 30 years. Oh, really? How many years of maturity have you acquired during that time? See, I've known of people with one year's worth of maturity who've been in the church for 30 years. They stopped growing 29 years ago. They are a novice. Length of time isn't what determines whether a person is weak spiritually. But Paul says he was able to spot them. You can tell when you talk with people in the church, you can tell by the word usage, by their vocabulary, how scripturally they speak how correctly they use biblical concepts, how deep is their understanding in the Word of God. You can tell real quick when you're dealing with someone who's weak spiritually. Paul says, I picked up on that, and I was careful with people like that. I became weak. I may have used a phrase that was uh, not as precise or not as technical as I would have used with somebody else. Why? Because they were weak. They weren't in a position Yet, to receive it, those weak or less mature in their understanding of the gospel. But the main thing is that I, by all means, again, by all legitimate means, obviously, might save some. You see where Paul's focus was throughout all of this process. Verse 23, and I do all things for the gospel's sake, that I may be a joint partaker thereof. Notice, there were things that Paul refrained from doing. He didn't want to cast a stumbling block in front of people. But there were other things that he affirmatively did. In fact, he says, I do all things for the gospel's sake. I, I suspect if, if you could have a conversation with the Apostle Paul about this time, talk to him, say, for example, about tent making. Why do you make tents, Paul? He wouldn't say, well, I make tents because I really appreciate the skill of making tents. And, and I just think about people who, who really would like to have a tent. And, and, it, and I really get into making tents. And, and he would go into a lengthy description about, no. He'd say, I'll tell you why I make tents. It's for the gospel's sake. And that would get your wheels turning, wouldn't it? Let me ask you a question. In your secular job, why do you do that? We have some nurses in the room tonight. Why are you a nurse? The answer is, according to Paul, everything I do is for the gospel's sake. Why are you a school teacher? A computer programmer? 
Well, it's because of the gospel, isn't it? If you're a Christian, a child of God, you get that. And the Apostle, Apostle Paul was saying, that's why I do what I do. He not only abstained from certain things, he actually did all things for the gospel's sake. And you see that this explains not only his inactions, but his actions. It's not enough as a Christian to say, well, I'm not going to smoke, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to use drugs, I'm not going to dance, I'm not going to dress immodestly, or whatever it is that you conclude that the Scriptures forbid you to do. I'm not going to do that. That's great. But what are you going to do with your life? You see, Paul says, I do all things for the gospel's sake. So that why? I may be a joint partaker thereof. That is, with those that I'm teaching, as they obey the gospel of Christ, they become children of God. Guess where we're going together? You see, I want to get to heaven, and I want to bring as many with me as I can, and I look forward to the time, Paul would say, when we can together enter in through those pearly gates, be a joint partaker of the, of the salvation that is in Jesus Christ, not only eternally, but even here and now, that we might jointly partake of the benefits of being a Christian. What a great blessing that is. Verse 24, know ye not that they that run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. Even so run that ye may attain. Now, Paul switches here to give us a helpful illustration, an illustration based on games that were conducted in that very region where he was writing to. They were familiar with the Isthmian games. They knew all about that, the training that would go into the participation in those games. Think of the Olympics, the intensive bodily exercise and training and mental discipline that goes into that kind of competition. Now, I want you to notice something about illustrations like this. In passing, this is true of illustrations generally, but this may be a good time to be reminded that illustrations are usually designed to illuminate some particular point. <clears throat> Not every point in the illustration will necessarily apply. Okay? For example, in this illustration about the games, he says, uh, they that run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. Now, this is a great illustration, but be careful not to press the illustration too far. More than one Christian is going to win the prize, folks. The point of this illustration is not to identify how many people will receive the prize, but to emphasize, rather, the competitive training and discipline that's required in order to get there to the prize. Paul is teaching here that I must, if I'm a Christian, I must really focus on this, on being a Christian. Everything I do in life... Now, if you're training for the, the Olympics, do you get up in the morning and decide what to have for breakfast and say, ah, oh, I think I'll have a couple of sausage, and, oh, maybe a big plate of pancakes and syrup. And, or do you think, wait a minute now, I am training for something out there. Every decision that I make from the moment I get out of bed in the morning, how I will eat, how I will drink, what, how I will exercise, where I go, even maybe with whom I will associate, all of those decisions are made with a goal in mind. That's the illustration that Paul provides for us here. Just think of it as a training experience. What's the point? Only the competitor who trains hard is going to win. Only the Christian who trains and disciplines hard is going to reach the prize. It's not going to be something that accidentally happens, folks. It's just not that way. We're going to have to make a diligent effort in living the Christian life. Verse 25 and 6, And every man that striveth in the games exerciseth self-control in all things, 
Now, they do it to receive a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as beating the air. See how Paul was determined, he was focused, intentional in every aspect of his Christian life. And the Christian life demands intentionality. It, it demands self-control, discipline. Corruptible there, the receiving a corruptible crown, means a crown that no matter how beautiful it may be, is eventually going to decay and fade away. It's a material crown, something tangible. I've known of uh, great athletes who have won, for example, a Super Bowl ring. And they were so proud of that. And I've heard of men who had received a Super Bowl ring, but because of a downturn in their life later on, had gotten so poor, so uh, less well off than they had been, that they basically had lost everything, and that there have been Super Bowl rings actually sold in public auctions. What is it really? It's a tangible thing, a possession that will eventually fade away and go back to the dust from which it came. But the crown that, that Paul is talking about, I'm striving for that crown, that's an incorruptible crown. That one fadeth not away. It is reserved in heaven for you and for me as children of God. So therefore, he's not like a wrestler practicing in the ring or fighting in the ring in a boxing match that's just, that's just beating the air. And you've all seen that, maybe an inexperienced fighter taking a lot of unnecessary punches. And they're not, he's not landing anything. He's just wearing himself out. Meaningless punches. We've got to be careful, folks, in living the Christian life that we're not like that. Paul says, I'm, that's not the way to be. Not like just beating the air. You need to make everything count. Focus what you're doing, why you're doing it, and keep your goal always in mind. And then verse 27, finally he says, but I buffet my body and bring it into bondage or subjection, lest by any means after that have preached to others, I myself should be rejected. The word Buffet there is the idea again of strong, consistent discipline. The 21st century King James Version has, I keep control of my body. That's the idea. Or I pummel my body, I think one translation has. Discipline, even a harsh, extreme, serious form of discipline. If the possibility of apostasy is taught anywhere in the scriptures, it's clearly taught here. That it is possible to apostatize or fall away. You know, there, there are those who have been taught that you can't fall away from grace. Once you're a Christian, once saved, always saved. This is an old Calvinistic doctrine, but it's not as old as the Bible. The Bible teaches that not only is it possible to fall away from grace... It is a danger of which we must be aware. And there are warnings in the Bible against it for that reason. So Paul would say, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, Therefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he, what, fall. Here in this passage again is very clearly taught the idea that it is certainly possible to fall away. Think of it, Paul spending all of that effort and energy to advance the cause of Christ and then slacking off what if he was to slack off toward the end of his life stop buffeting his body as it were disciplining himself spiritually speaking what would happen he says I myself would be rejected no nope, we've got to maintain discipline maintain that faith that focus all the way to the end be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. 
Let's uh, close this evening with some points to ponder. Now, I want to come back to the back burner with you and recall what we threw out there a little earlier. Let's remember, folks, that our main purpose in this life is to glorify God and to bring as many souls to him as possible. That's why we're here. We're not here necessarily to advance our own interests. Now, if advancing our own interests leads to greater glory for God, leads to an advancement of these goals, then so be it. But our purpose is not to glorify ourself. It's not to see uh, you know, how, how far we can get politically or powerfully or well-connected in this world. No. In fact, uh, John would say, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Our purpose is to stay focused on God and our heavenly home to which we're heading when this short life is over. Secondly, remember that reaching others with the gospel may require us to, quote, get out of our comfort zone. Some of you are out of your comfort zone here in this auditorium. You're not sitting where you normally sit. I noticed when people were coming in, maybe for the first time in the auditorium in a number of weeks, they saw tape across the place where they wanted to go, <laughs> would normally go in. And what did they do? Well, they just ripped the tape down and sat there anyway. Do you believe that? <laughs> no. They got out of their comfort zone. Why did they do that? Well, they understood that that would be a, a wise, courteous thing to do. But you know, all of life is like that. If we're going to reach other people with the gospel, we're going to have to go where they are, aren't we? We're, if we're going to reach a person with the good news of Jesus Christ, we're going to have to become like them. Now, don't misunderstand me, but isn't that what Paul said? I have become all things to all men, that by all means I might save some. He didn't adopt their sinful lifestyle, but he went to their turf. He got out of his comfort zone and went over to theirs and, and reached them with the gospel of Christ. I've known of a few brethren down through the years who wouldn't give up their parking place in the parking lot, much less get out of their comfort zone to reach somebody with the gospel. Folks, we're not going to get very far in reaching the lost if we don't move to their turf. Paul says there's a lot of ways that I did that. I did it racially. I did it religiously. I did it in terms of maturity. I tried to relate to people the best that I could with what God gave me in order to reach the lost. So with that in mind, let me uh, ask you this question as we close. To reach the lost, when was the last time that you, that you personally, did two things? First, gave up something that you wanted to do. When was the last time that you gave up something that you wanted to do? Well, I'm not going to Sunday night services because I want to watch Columbo on TV. Did you hear that? Reaction. That was a person who's never even heard of Columbo. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to knock on any doors because I don't want to do that. I'm not going to speak to my neighbor about Jesus Christ because I don't want to do that. I'm not going to invite my friends to the services because I don't want to do that. When was the last time I gave up something that I wanted to do? And then the other half of that, when was the last time that I did something I didn't really want to do? <laughs> Which is the other half of the same question, really. Getting out of my comfort zone means saying to my Lord, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. 
Here am I, Lord, send me. Tell me what I must do. Make me an instrument of yours. I hope that these thoughts have been helpful to you in remembering what our main purpose is and what the main thing is all about here in this life so that by all means we might also save someone as a child of God. If you are not a child of God this evening, please review carefully the scriptures on the screen before you. Please think seriously about Jesus' great invitation to come under him, unto him and to do the things that the Bible requires you to do in order to be saved. Our contact information has been posted also on the screen, including our phone number, our email address, and during these times of limited in-person interaction, you can still reach out by telephone or email, and we'll do whatever we can do to assist you in your obedience to the gospel. And I pray that that will be your desire and your intention, that you'll not let that opportunity pass you by if you're subject to the Lord's invitation. This evening, if you're here in person and need to respond in any way, we will stand humbly here at the front to receive you if we may help you in your obedience. Would you come while we stand and sing?